Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston. I'm the director of recruiting with VIP, an executive recruiter, and your all-around hiring guru. And you know it is my pleasure to bring to you all the cool and neat thought leaders that I get to meet throughout my journeys. So today on the show, I'd like to welcome Morag Barrett, a highly accomplished keynote speaker, leadership development expert, and best-selling author of Cultivate, The Power of Winning Relationships. Morag is also the founder and CEO of SkyTeam, a leadership development firm that has supported more than 15,000 leaders in achieving outstanding results by improving the effectiveness of their leadership. Morag, thank you so much for joining us today. Casey, I am so excited. Looking forward to our conversation. <laughs> it seems like we this is deja vu. It does a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> so one of the things that I like to do to start off the conversation is really talk about connections because I really want to encourage people to connect those dots and create that spider web so that, you know, when, when you need your network, you've established it through your connections, right? So how did we get connected? Well, we met through the role model for being an ally, the concept I share in my book, Cultivate, the fabulous Frank Hagen. And we met at one of his events and he was like, oh, you need to talk to Casey. And (laughs) Casey, you need to talk to Morag. And then the rest is history. He is so good at that, you know, and I don't know if I've told this story on the podcast before, but I'm just gonna tell it real quick. When Frank reached out to me on LinkedIn, you know, and I'm, I'm a networker. I love to connect with people and I, I call myself a people collector, but in a good way. Right. And mm-hmm. he reached out to me and he's like, so what's special about you? And I said, oh, people refer to me as the networking ninja. Huh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. With Frank Agan. Are you kidding me? That's like, foot oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he puts us to, to shame and he's got the networking dojo, but he is a great example. And even your opening comment there is that we need to be investing in our relationships and network today, every day before we need people and before we find ourselves in a pickle and turning to others for help. Yes. So this isn't a nice to have this conversation we're going to be having about connections and creating a culture of connection. It is a need to have individually and for our businesses and for our teams. 100% agree with you. And there's a saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm probably going to totally butcher this about, you know, feeding your well or not letting your well run dry before you need it. So I, I, I mm-hmm. totally messed that up, but that's okay. That's okay. I get the track. I've heard it. I get it. Yes, <laughs> that's it. And it's little deposits. And I think people often assume that networking and maintaining connection takes time and effort. And of course, now that we are all disconnected and working from home and living in these little three by five box, it's even more important. And it's as simple as send a message, yeah. pick up the phone, um, write a handwritten card, anything just to say, hey, I was thinking of you today, Casey. I hope all is well. And that is a deposit in the well, into the relationship bank account that will stand you in the stead of time when you actually need to start making withdrawals. Oh, and I love how you just said that about making withdrawals. So there is an app out there called Really Linked. Have you heard of it? I have not. I need to go and investigate. What is it? So it's like a mini CRM, but it helps remind you to do just that. So I think it only allows you to have like 50 contacts in there at any given time but it reminds you like, it's time to send an email, it's time to send a note. Mm -hmm. And you would have done that had you thought of it, but we all have so much going on in our lives nowadays. Yes. And so why not cheat a little bit and get something to help remind you to keep up with your contacts? 
Well, I'm going to change it. It's not cheating. It's smart because <laughs> none of us can hold all of this in our minds. I think about my LinkedIn connections, 10,000 people. And literally just before we got on this call, Casey, a guy, Alan, hey, Alan, if you're watching, <laughs> he commented on one of my posts. And so I've sent him a message to reconnect. And we probably haven't spoken to each other in four years. We were working together on a project and we haven't needed to. But him, just seeing his name pop up, made me smile and we've reconnected so you can do it in bite-sized chunks just when you see somebody announce a new role on linkedin send them a message saying congratulations when you get to the holidays it's falling out of fashion send a holiday card when you get the facebook reminder of whose birthday is it today use it as the trigger and those little reminders those little outreaches i guarantee will strengthen every relationship that you choose to touch it's, and so I know that's not what we were really coming on to talk about today, but that was such good stuff. I love that. And, you know, just, and, and I love the handwritten note. You know, I mm -hmm. keep cards that, that are very generic so that I can tailor mm -hmm. them to do anything that I want them to do. Yeah. Um, and I can send. Um, and I just, I love that advice. I think that it's such an old fashioned, but just good practice. Powerful. Powerful. So today I want to talk a little bit more about you. And I know one of your programs is called Cultivate at Work. And this is something I think exists in every single company. So your Cultivate at Work program is focused on developing and improving work relationships and helps people learn how to deal with those toxic colleagues. Mm -hmm. So what is a toxic colleague and why are they especially difficult to deal with? So if, you, if we go back to our first conversation, they're at the opposite end of the scale to the people that we just mentioned. And so we know when we have a toxic colleague because we avoid them. We, in the olden days when we were in the office, you would dial into the meeting versus going and attending in person because you just didn't want to be in a room with them, even though we were in the same building. And a toxic colleague tends to be the one where it, it, it feels contentious, like we're always butting heads. And it's exhausting. And for those listening and watching our conversation, Casey, if you've ever gone home at the end of a long day or walked out of the bedroom or away from the kitchen table as we are now and said to the dog or somebody, oh, you won't believe what happened at work today, what so-and-so said or did, then my, my advice is, hey, sign up for Cultivate at Work or call me because you're in a relationship that if not toxic and adversarial now is on that path. And ultimately, it's going to slow you down and slow down the business results that you and your team are trying to achieve. Well, and I think earlier, and I love that, that, but I think earlier in a conversation that we were having, you were saying that it's like, for example, if I'm in a workplace with a toxic colleague, that some of this is my responsibility to deal with this toxic colleague. So can you oh, talk absolutely. a little bit about that? Yeah, well, it's like I'm a ballroom dancer, or I was when I was allowed up close within Ooh. six feet of others. And as the <laughs> phrase goes, we'll keep with the metaphors, it takes two to tango. And invariably, when we have a tense relationship, often we have not sat down to understand what are the rules of engagement of how are we going to work together. So I might be sitting here thinking, you know, we're about to go and meet with a client. We need to get there, you know, on time. And for me, on time means we're in reception at 15 minutes to the hour. We let the um, security guard or whomever know we're here to visit Casey at 10 to the hour so that you've got time to get the message up and then you come and get us. Well, if I've never told my colleagues that and they're rolling up at five to the hour, and if I don't have the courage to set expectations, then inside I'm fuming. My colleague can pick up on the vibes. They know I'm miffed at them, but they don't understand why. And then the cycle re repeats itself. So often missed expectations are because we never sat down and articulated what the rules of engagement are and how it might be different at Sky Team, my company, to any other consulting firm that you may have worked at. So the culpable negligence, if you're venting, if you're frustrated with a colleague, have you actually shared how they're pushing your buttons? Have you actually asked for something different? Have you tried doing something different to affect change? And if the answer is no, then A, read my book, Cultivate, or join us at Cultivate at Work, because I have the secret to success and to reduce the tension and the frustration you might be feeling. And I'm curious, I want to take that just a step further. Let's say we've done all those things with this mm -hmm. toxic colleague. 
what, what's the, and they're not going away, you're not going away. You're forced to work with this person and you've tried everything to reduce the toxicity in the relationship. What's the next step? Well, there's two parts to it. One is, is it just you? Because sometimes our styles are different. You know, I put a U and an S in things. You don't. You put a Z in things. I say Z, you say Z. That can be enough for it to be a toxic <laughs> relationship. But here's the thing at work. We have to work respectfully together, even when we don't like each other. And so it still comes back to the conversation of let's just agree that we're never going to hang out after work. I'm not going to bring you home to meet my mother, but how do we show respect? Because if we don't, everybody in the organization is watching. And I've seen this. I was coaching two senior leaders in an organization that were all out war. Uh, one did product and one did operation. Operations, and they were in war for the budget for their, their favorite pro new product, product one. So they went ahead, they developed the new shiny object, the new shiny service, hand it over to operations. Well, do you think it was a success? No, because they still scuppered it. So business suffers. And of course, all of the teams are watching these two leaders and they're going, Casey, did you hear what happened on the fourth floor today? And of course, the, it's like a soap opera. The ripple effect continues and it, it continues in that you start seeing those politics silos and turf wars further down in the organization, but you also see people slowing down information. Because if I know you've just had a fight with your adversary, if you're not having a good day, well, I'm not gonna come and tell you I'm about to miss my quota or there's been a, a customer complaint, I'm going to wait. So information slows down, decision quality gets impacted, and ultimately leadership reputations suffer, either because we've allowed that behavior to continue or we didn't have the courage to step up to affect change. Man, that is so good. And I know there's no way, like if this exists in your organization that you're gonna be able to implement change just based on this little short conversation, but it ought to get you thinking. And it ought to, mm -hmm. you know, get you looking for some resources like Mirag or any other coach out there. But today, Cultivate at Work might be a good solution for you. Yeah, well, I'll give you some bonus tips. I'll give you the, the dark side first. If you're listening to this and going, oh, that's either me, because remember, it's a thin line between my misunderstood genius and what I'm trying to achieve and it landing badly. And at best, you thinking of me as a brilliant jerk <laughs> or at worst, just a jerk. So whichever end of the scale, if you've got a toxic relationship at work, even something as simple as, hey, I was listening to We Are VIP and they were talking about quality of relationships at work. It made me think about you and I, and it feels like we've been butting heads the last few times. How is it for you? And then just see where it goes. That can be enough to start to affect change. Use me as the excuse for re, uh, raising the topic versus you're a jerk, I don't like you, you were mean <laughs> to me at playtime yesterday. Guarantee that won't work. But hey, I was listening. I want us to work more effectively together. What's one thing I can do to help you to be successful? You know, I think that, I, you know, I told you that I was going to coaching school when we last talked. So I'm finished, yeah. I'm now certified. Hey, I know, I'm so excited. But that was one of the things that I really took out of there was the active listening and the intuitive listening. And I brought that back to, you know, my perspective and how I was showing up for people. And it's really changed. And, you know, I think maybe I was that brilliant jerk sometimes, mm -hmm. maybe. But it helped me recognize that and change the way that I was responding. So yeah. I felt pretty good about that. If nothing else comes out of the coaching school, I learned to be a better human being, you know? Yay, love it, love it. <laughs> I love that. And here's the thing, nobody gets out of work, uh, out of bed in the morning, Casey, to say, hey, I want to be seen as a brilliant jerk or I want to be as difficult as I can to my colleagues. But invariably, it does happen, especially in times like 2020 and 2021, oh. where emotions are raised, opinions differ, we're uncertain about the way forward then that is an, ab an opportunity rife for misinterpreting behavior mm -hmm. in others as being toxic and blockers. Whereas in fact, we're all trying to do the same thing, which is how do we navigate this successfully? Mm -hmm. Another small tip, we're living here now on camera. Please turn your cameras on. Yeah. Even if it's just for a minute to say hi, and then because of bandwidth issues, you have to switch it off. But being able to see each other matters. And the other thing is, even though you can only see me to here, 
trust me, if you're trying to multitask and do emails and have other browsers open, the camera actually amplifies that body language. And when you're looking away, I know you're not paying attention. So now I don't feel like you value my opinion. I don't feel heard. I certainly don't feel a sense of connection. So you know what? We're starting the downward spiral of a relationship that is disconnecting versus connected. That and could lead to a toxic relationship. That's, and, and exactly. I, I want to point out, so, so many things that you just said right there apply in so many different situations. Mm -hmm. Primarily, like right now, most of our candidates are interviewing on video with our mm -hmm. clients. And, and they're even onboarding virtually and training virtually. And so it's, it's completely different out there today than it used to be. And what you just said there, like that could win the interview when you're on Absolutely. Zoom. You know, keep yeah. that... So I think that's beautiful. That's way more than we asked for today. So thank you for that great knowledge nugget. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how collaboration within a team can affect business results. W what have you seen? Oh, well, so I spent 15 years in finance in my first career, analyzing business plans, cash flow forecasts. Everybody arrives with, hey, I've got the best new widget. <laughs> I like unicorns. Best new widget. We're all going to get rich on unicorns. And then they are unable to deliver. And I was recently working with a senior executive team, a senior IT team, who had literally spent three years bringing a new product to market only to have a competitor seize the moment. And they brought us in. And when we went to have a look, it wasn't because it wasn't a fabulous unicorn or a fabulous new product. It was the infighting, the lack of clarity around roles and responsibilities. It was all about how business gets done that undermined their success. In that case, it was a multi-million dollar impact to their bottom line. The project was delayed and obviously they'd lost market share. But what we were able to do was to turn it around to repair those relationships from adversarial or spectator, which is, hey, not my fault, my bit's okay, I'm gonna wait for somebody to tell me to do different, and get people rallied around. Within six months, they were back on track and able to relaunch, but even launch better because of the learnings and what they'd seen from their competitor as they hit the marketplace. So it comes, but it's letting go of the chip on your shoulder and it takes a commitment at all levels of the organization to affect change at a team and a company level. But first of all, it just starts one on one, one conversation at a time. And again, if you're thinking about a toxic colleague or a colleague where you may have stepped on their toes, maybe tomorrow is the time to pick up the phone, do a Zoom call to give a heartfelt apology, clear the slate and start again afresh. Yeah, and I think 2021, even though it's kind of an imaginary line between 2020 mm -hmm. and 2021, gives us the perfect excuse to do that in so many situations. Mm -hmm. So I think that's great advice. So I read an interview in which you shared that as business professionals, we tend to focus on what needs to be delivered in business, and we don't talk about how we're going to work together to deliver those results, which kind of sounds like the example you just gave. So why is it important to focus on this side of work? Well, there are four questions we're asking ourselves consciously or subconsciously in every interaction. Your listeners and viewers are asking it about this episode. You and I are asking it about each other. Number one is, can I count on you? Mm. Can I count on you to show up? You know, if I'm interviewing for a new job, look smart and, and share my story and get it done in the time allowed. That's reactive table stakes. Can I depend on you is question two. And that's the not just deliver it like a robot, but bring some humor, bring some insights, add additional value you weren't expecting. And those are transactional. And in my banking career, many relationships started and stopped. The transformational piece is, can you make a connection? Do I care about you? Do I care about your success as much as my own? Am I willing to lend you that A star new intern or new employee mm -hmm. because it's right for their career or right for the project? Or am I hoarding it for my team and my goodness? And then finally, do I trust you? Mm -hmm. Now, a year ago, those might be easy yeses, Casey, because you and I would have been coming into the office every day. We'd see you in the breakout room. Um, we might have lunch every now and then. Four yeses. But here we are a year later, and again, everything now is being done virtual. So here's what I'm hearing from the C-suite who are calling me for help. They focused on 
all good grief, close the office, get everybody home. But they didn't focus on how do we nurture the sense of team and connection. So think about it, can you count on me? Well, I'm working at the kitchen table. I haven't got a good solid uh, bandwidth or a VPN, so not always. Can you depend on me go the extra mile? Well, I've got three kids who need to be logged on to online learning and school at 9 a.m. So no, I'm not going to be ready for that client meeting tomorrow morning. And then do I care about you? Well, the only time you call me for the Zoom, Google, Hangout, Meet nonstop <laughs> is when you want something or you're checking in on a deadline. You don't ask, how am I doing? How am I feeling? What's happening with my, in my case, my father-in-law in the UK who I can't visit, who's ill? and therefore is always at the back of my mind. So do I get to four yeses? At best, I'm four maybes, and at worst, I'm four heck no's. And then we're back to the spiral. So every interaction, don't just get straight down to visit. Even something as simple as, hey, grab something on your desk. <laughs> you don't even have to ask me about it. Ask a few people there, but there's a sense of connection. We've brought a, a human element versus just the business element to the to the conversation and i now know you like unicorns you, you try to slide <laughs> yeah, that under <laughs> yeah well, my clients know we have unicorns if you can't see it but there are many unicorns in my house it was a chance comment to a colleague that took on a life of its own but i work on the basis i'd rather be known as the unicorn lady than the cat lady <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. So what are three keys to creating a collaborative culture? So first of all is to be able to articulate what does that mean for you? And how do you want others to feel in your presence? How do you want to feel in your own presence? Because we have to be allies to ourselves. Think about the trash talk. Mm -hmm. How hard are you? Things we tell ourselves that we would never say to others. So how do I want others to feel in my presence. Then number two is be intentional, live up to it. If you can articulate it, you need to now live up to it. Despite what might be coming back to you from others, you can still show up as an ally to yourself and others on your team. And then thirdly is to reflect at the end of the day, just ask yourself, did I do my best? And if a conversation didn't go to plan, maybe you delivered some feedback and it landed poorly, don't beat yourself up. Give yourself the grace to say, okay, tomorrow, a new start. I'll be intentional. This is how I want people to feel. These are the behaviors and how I'm going to show up so that I can be my best and help others to be at their best. When let's face it, the outside world has caused all sorts of triggers to try and move us to being at our worst. You know, and I love that you brought up the voices in your head that are talking mm -hmm. to you, the trash talk, right? And I talk about this yeah. all the time about, you know, writing scripts in your head. And it's mm -hmm. so easy to fill in the gaps of information with stuff that's not true. Yes. And especially now, because, for example, maybe my to-do list, and I could show it to you. It's crazy, Casey. Oh. Um, <laughs> so people are going to take screenshots now and think about what's on it. But it's long. And here I am. I'm up to here. And maybe I'm thinking about my colleague in another state or in another office. And I start to write a story, which is, it's just me, because nobody's calling to check in on me. He's got it easy. That's not fair. Well, they obviously don't value me. So I start to withdraw. Mm -hmm. And again, do you see how quickly those stories either impact my engagement, my productivity. They turn into awfulizing where I'm not happy at work and certainly not when I walk out of the bedroom into the, the rest of the house. And it impacts... Uh, every aspect of how we show up and it can damage relationships. So stories always, you don't have to believe everything you think is the phrase oh, I use. I and love when you that. start on that loop, ask what else? Why would a rational human being say this or do this about me? Give yourself options and then go and ask for feedback because you may just find your colleague is also up to here. Well, your colleague just didn't know to ask and hey i can take half of your to-do list and now the stress is reduced or you may have just totally made up a story i used to be really good at yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> you know exactly and, and then the other thing that you said and, and it resonated so well with me as being an ally to yourself and when i heard you say that what i heard in my mind was showing up authentically is that mm -hmm. what you're talking about 
It is, and that's a big theme for my next book. The working title is Best Friends at Work. And the reality being here, when we have the four yeses, when we have a trust-based relationship, when we're allies, and I know you have my back and vice versa, I don't have to pretend anymore. Right. I can show up as me. I can show up to, and say, hey, Casey, I'm having a tough one. I didn't sleep well last night. Bear with me. And you're more likely to forgive because of the deposits I've made into the relationship mm -hmm. bank account. Or I can say to you, Casey, you know that new project, that new client engagement? I've never done this before. What should I do first? Or I've got this client that's unhappy. How do I respond? But we're more likely to ask for help, to give help, to, to thrive together. That's it. I mean, competition doesn't go away when we're allies, but now we're raising the bar and helping each other to learn and grow versus can I knock you down and can I win? Yes. That's the toxic relationship. Yes. My mom always told me that it was like a bucket of crabs. Because, you know, if you Ooh, have a bucket same. of crabs, you're, all the crabs are always trying to step on the other crabs to get out. Yes. And that's what I think of. That's what I saw when you were talking about the toxic relationships was a mm -hmm. bucket of crabs. Yep. Yep. So, so don't be a crab. Don't be a crab. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned friendships and say the name of your new book again. So, well, it's still being written, so it may change. We're at the moment, it's best friends at work and how an ally mindset will, will transform career, team, and happiness. It's, it's still in, in the works. <laughs> it well, will hit the shelves hopefully towards the end of 21. So watch this space, connect with me on LinkedIn, and I'll happily let everybody know when it's ready. That is so awesome. And I better, I, I want another signed copy. I'm not being greedy. Oh, promise. <laughs> so is there a difference between friendships and collaborative relationships within a company? And where do we draw the line? So I was thinking about this question. It's a great question. And I, I came up with the analogy of a Hoover and a vacuum cleaner. A what? A what exactly? <laughs> so a Hoover is a brand of vacuum cleaner, but I'm going to turn it into friendship and collaborative relationships. So not all collaborative relationships will become friendships. But in my experience, all friendships tend to be collaborative relationships. Oh. So here's what I mean, and it goes back to my earlier comment. You and I don't get to choose that we are work colleagues, and maybe we have to work on this project in 2021, and then who knows beyond that. But we have to work respectfully together. We have to be collaborative, even though we don't like each other and don't want to hang out together after work. Now, if you are friends, and we've all got allies at work, at least I hope you've got at least one best friend. If not, call me, I'll be your best friend. <laughs> and best friends are the people you turn to, especially on the tough days, because it's easy to be collaborative when things are going well and your sales quota is coming in and everybody's happy. The true test of relationships is what happens when there is uncertainty, when there is disagreement, when the proverbial is hitting the fan. Who is ready and willing to step up with you to help solve for that versus leaving you isolated and vulnerable? So collaborative relationships may not always end up in friendships that last forever, but where you do like each other, where you can be friends first, then in my experience, they are invariably your go-to people that you can rely on, on the good days, but especially on the tough days. I think that is a beautiful place to wrap up. We are almost out of time, and that was just amazing. I, I cannot wait for the final uh, version, the episode to come out so that I can go back and listen to it again because I know there's just tons of knowledge nuggets in there, and I just want to devour it. But before we go, I do want to ask you our three VIP questions. <laughs> yep. Are you ready for those? I am. Sweet. So if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three things or people would you take with you? So here's the thing. I've always wanted to be a space explorer. And uh, if I could take three things or three people, firstly, it would be MacGyver. Mm. Because I'm sure there's going to be things we didn't think about. And MacGyver <laughs> can make anything out of anything and get us out of that pickle. Um, my uncle Harold, my great uncle Harold, who was a well-renowned archaeologist, so his stories about history and the projects that he worked on, very smart man who unfortunately passed away when I was uh, in my early 20s, but 
I didn't invest as much time as I would have liked to have learned from him. And then all of the musics, all of the musics in the world, and I'll work my way through the, the catalog. I am a classical musician, but I like music. So that would be it. So MacGyver, my great uncle Harold, and music. So I like how you just lumped music into one great big old thing. One thing. Well, then you never run out. I've got music. <laughs> Can you imagine everything from madrigals to rock to jazz to classical to the voice to instrument. Yeah. So did you sing or did you play an instrument or both? Oh, I play. So I play bassoon and <gasps> flute and piano. Nice. I play piano as well. Well, there you go. We should do yeah. duets. We should, if I can remember how to play. <laughs> yeah, well, same here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, second question. This is probably one of my favorite questions. What is one thing you do each morning to set your day up for success? So this I learned from my colleague, Eric Spencer, and it comes from a book from BJ Fogg called Tiny Habits. And it is this simple. When I get up in the morning, when my feet hit the ground, today is going to be a great day. And just having that mantra makes a huge difference. So that's what I do. I love I it. I believe and I say today is going to be a great day. I love it. All right, my final question. If your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? It takes two to tango. Why relationships matter in business. That's okay. beautiful. <laughs> this has been so much fun today. I, I knew it was going to be. I was so looking forward to the conversation. How do people find you so they can experience your greatness like I have? Well, the advantage of an unusual name, Morag Barrett, is that you can find me anywhere. I fill up the Googles. But please <laughs> connect with me on LinkedIn and I do respond. If you send me a message, I am going to reply. But you can also find more about me at Sky Team, and that's S K Y E for the Isle of Skye off Scotland. Skyteam.com. And then you also generously mentioned cultivate at work.com, which is where our online resources are for how to cultivate your own ally relationships. I love it. This has been so much fun. And I know we're going to have to talk again soon because I just, I can't live in a world without you. So you're going to talk in. So I just have one last thing to say to you. You are a VIP. Thank you. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.